Good morning, everybody out there. You know, it's early. Um, actually, it's about 8 a.m. right now. And um, I don't really expect a lot of people to get on here. But um, I want to get on here. And I want to to share some something that I actually came across um, a few days ago. I said on Facebook that I was going to share it. And what better time to, you know, to share it than to do it right now? Because honestly, um, I don't know if we're going to make it to service this morning. Um, I'm dealing with some uh, with some issues right now. Um, I have an abscess in my mouth. And I'm on antibiotics, so that's not fun. And one of my kids, my oldest, I think he's dealing with like the um, pink eye or something. Um, I dealt with it earlier this year. Uh, my youngest child, he dealt with it earlier this year, and now it seems like it's getting over to him. So I'm not sure if um, we're going to make it to church this morning. But nonetheless, even if we don't make it to church this morning, you know, we can we can do this right here. You know, we can do it right here. You know, the, the Bible tells us that where three or more are gathered, um, there I am in the midst of them. The Lord is in the midst of you. So um, you don't necessarily have to be in the building of a church to worship. Um, although I really highly recommend that you do go to church if you're able to go, then go ahead and do that. But if you can't, um, hopefully that you receive, you know, the message that I'm going to go ahead and relay today. Or maybe some sermon, something that you want to listen to on Sunday, whatever the case is. OK, so but if you can go to church, go to church. You know, if you can't, if you just physically are ill or something's wrong. Um, that's a whole other story. So, um, I was, uh, I made a um, post on the 29th that I was doing a study on faith. Okay. So a lot of us, we use that word loosely. We, we don't really know the terminology behind faith. Um, if you ask a person, what is faith? They may give you several different definitions, but um, the biblical definition of faith is, you know, what we should be, you know, putting most of our attention towards. OK, so, you know, everything is biblical that I'm going to talk about today. Got my Bible right here. I want to be going back and forth to it throughout this time period. So the subject we're going to talk about several subjects, actually. We're going to talk about several subjects, but the first subject we're going to talk about is faith. OK, um, and the study that I did was on healing and faith. Because I, for one, still believe that God has the ability to heal people. Um, you have some people that feel like he doesn't. Yes, he does. I feel like he can still heal people. But there's a stipulation. And that stipulation is your faith. Do you know that your faith has the ability to have a prayer answered or to have a prayer hindered? You know, our faith is extremely important. So what I've done to kick this off is, you know, I've defined both the words healing and faith. So the definition of healing is the process of making someone healthy. OK, I think we I think we all know that. And this is this is just how I'm kicking it off. OK, and the, the definition of faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things that are unseen, meaning we are we have faith that things are going to happen before they even happen. So that is faith in a nutshell, seeing something come to pass before it actually comes to pass. OK, being hopeful that something comes to pass before it even manifests itself here in reality. That is what faith is. OK, so. Um, in Matthew 9, um, I, I'm pretty sure a lot of you know this story, but in Matthew 9, there was a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. Now, what that issue of blood was, I have no idea what that issue of blood was. But if you want to try to take this into a, a modern way of, um, of trying to diagnose what this woman had, um, the issue of blood could have potentially been um, an abnormal issue with her menstrual cycle, perhaps. I'm not sure. But since we're talking about a woman and we're associating her problem to be with blood, 
the only thing I can really think of is um, she probably has some sort of abnormal menstrual cycle that, you know, is unheard of. Maybe we can all do some research or some studies to see if there's a such thing as an abnormal menstrual cycle that's being diagnosed today. But anyway, um, it goes on to say that she had this issue for 12 years, okay, and she was healed from it, all right? Now, she had faith, okay, that if she touched the garment of Jesus, that she would be healed. That was what she put her faith in. Her faith was literally, there's Jesus, I'm going to touch him, I'm going to touch his garment, and I'm going to be healed. So she, she basically saw it before it came to pass. She was hopeful for it before it came to pass, especially since you have, you know, the Lord himself right in front of you. So it's kind of hard to not have faith when Jesus is walking right in front of you, okay? So when she touched his garment, she was healed. But it wasn't the fact that he touched, I mean, she touched his garment that healed her. It was the fact that she had faith that if she touched his garment, that she would be healed. Because anybody could, you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of people touched Christ, you know, hugged them, whatever, just whatever. Not, and miraculous things probably didn't happen to them. But it was the fact that she had faith in touching him that she was healed. And Jesus goes on to say, daughter. Be of good comfort. Thy faith had made thee whole. So he's not saying, well, the fact that you touched me made you whole. He's saying your faith, you, your faith has made you whole. So there is a prime example of our faith uh, literally moving mountains, <laughs> literally causing things to happen that would not happen typically if we did not have faith okay so her hope was in touching jesus so that she would be healed faith that it would solve her problem and it did her faith literally solved her problem okay faith in god faith in his ability to heal so without faith this is in the book of hebrews and um i want to read that i'm paraphrasing here um without faith we can do nothing which is true, but we must be hopeful in the power of God to reign in our lives, okay? So I, I have to agree that without faith in God, it's, it's really, really difficult to do anything. It's hard to get anything done. It's hard to focus. Um, we are finite beings. We're not infinite. We don't have the answers to all questions. We don't have the solutions to all problems, um, trying to figure things out would basically make our heads explode and it just would not be a good thing, which is why I would much rather put my faith in God than just try to figure things out because there isn't a single instance in the Bible that tells us you figure it out, you do it. Um, God, well, tough luck, you know, I'm just going to sit here on the side and just watch you figure this out. God never told us to figure nothing out. He told us to be hopeful. He told us to believe. He told us to seek him. He told us to have faith and allow him to do the rest. Okay. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This is Hebrews eleven six. 6. Okay. Again, without faith. We can't please God. We can't please God. It's impossible. This is basically saying that if you don't have faith, there's really no reason in you praying. If you don't have faith, there's no reason in you seeking God because it's impossible to please him if we don't have faith. It's impossible. But I like the end of this when it says he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. He's a rewarder. Meaning, if you seek God, you know, wholeheartedly with faith, he's going to bless you. He's going to reward you because you have decided to put your trust in him and you have not decided to believe otherwise or to be dismayed or to come to him with no confidence. We got to have confidence in God. You want God to do something for you. 
But if you don't have any confidence in him, I don't really understand how you can see him uh, doing anything. So in the book of James, it tells us that um, with, a, with a lack of faith, you know, nothing will come to pass. Okay, so let's go ahead and read that. And again, I have all this written down. I'll take all of these notes, all of these notes um, I get out of the Bible. So this isn't just me writing, okay? All right, James 1, uh, verses 6 and 7 says, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavered is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he should receive anything of the Lord. Okay. Again, if you're going to come to God, it has to be with faith. Now, I highlighted here wavering because it's saying, um, but let him ask in faith, like whatever you ask God for, let him ask in faith, not wavering. Okay. And it goes on to say, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. So I took it upon myself to look for the root word of wavering, which is waver. And basically, I have it written down here. It means to valicate um, between choices fluctuating in opinion, allegiance, or direction also, to weave or to sway unsteadily to and fro. So basically to waver is in a nutshell to doubt. Okay, you're going back and forth with God. You're going back and forth with God. You have faith, but you doubt. You're like, Lord, I, I, I believe that you're going to do this. I believe that you're going to do that. But then you go back over here and you're like, I don't know, God. Are you sure you can do that? Or you, you know, what if this happens? Or, or what if that happens? And that's what the Bible calls wavering. Wavering means doubt. You're doubting. You're doubting God. You're, you're procrastinating with God. You're going back and forth on what you say. And the Bible says that, you know, if you're going to come to him, if you're going to ask anything of him, you need to have faith. I was having a conversation with one of my clients the other day, and we were talking about this, and I said, look, you either need to come to God with all of your heart, or you don't need to come at all. You're either coming like a full force, or you're going to come not at all, because it's it's pointless for you to seek God if you don't have faith in him, okay? And it goes on to say in the book of James 1, verse 7, for let not that man, you know, the man that chooses to waver, the man that chooses to doubt, for let not that man think that he should receive anything of the Lord. So if you're doubting and you don't have faith and your confidence is low or your belief is low, you're not going to get nothing, nothing. God won't do nothing for you, nothing. Now, don't take my word for it, okay? Read it for yourself. Go to the book of James, um, verses one. I mean, sorry, y'all, chapter one, verses six through seven. Because th this is a, this is the stuff that people don't talk a lot about. You know, everybody's like, pray, 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 but nobody is talking about what goes in conjunction with prayer, which is faith, which is confidence. You know, these things go in conjunction with pray. It, it, you can't just pray and expect God to just do things. I mean, are you praying? With a whole heart, are you praying with the utmost faith? Are you praying with confidence? Do you truly believe that God can do what it is you are asking him to do? Okay, you know, these are the questions we need to ask ourselves when we pray. And if you struggle with that, then you need to take a moment and you need to pray and ask God, hey, I struggle with my faith. I need help. I need you to strengthen me. I need you to restore my faith in you, my belief in you. Because praying without faith is is it's pointless. You know, to say the least, it's pointless. Okay. So um, I I actually paraphrase some stuff here too. I'm saying basically a person who goes back and forth with doubt will receive nothing, which is the truth. You'll receive nothing from God. This person is considered double-minded. You will either you um you will either have have faith to trust in God completely with your issues, or you will doubt His power to do great things in your life. So it's the truth. You're, you're either going to believe that God can do miraculous things in your life, 
or you're going to sit on the sideline and put him in the box as if he doesn't have the ability to change anything in your life, which is ridiculous because we're talking about the creator of heaven and earth. We're talking about uh, the creator of all flesh. We're talking about uh, the person, the, the, the high and mighty infinite being, um, infinite being that created you, that created me, that created everybody. So why is it we, we won't have confidence that God won't do things for us. You know, I believe in the power of prayer. Like I said, I did a, um, a live on prayer a few days ago. See, go back a couple of days and you'll see uh, what I was talking about. Okay. Okay. So. These are just notes I took right here as I was reading. I went on to say, I believe that we can do all things through faith, which is in the book of Philippians. That is the will of God. Big one right there. That is the will of God. So we need to make sure that whatever it is we're praying for, whatever it is we're asking for, that it is the will of God. Okay. I believe that our faith can heal us. I truly believe that. Um, I believe that our faith can open doors of opportunity. I also believe that too. And I believe that our faith can increase our wisdom. So all of this right here. And if you're just chiming in, we're talking about faith. Okay. Um, our faith has the ability to mold our life. You cannot get through life without faith. You just can't do it. And if you try, you'll fail miserably. This is why so many people, God, you know, they, they commit suicide and they just end their life because they think um, there's no hope. They think there's no hope. And again, going back to the definition of faith, the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things that are unseen, that is the definition of faith, okay? So we're going to go to some more Bible, um, the book of Romans, uh, chapter 1, verse 17. For therein the righteous of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, you're going to see, you're going to hear me um, talk about this in the next couple of uh, chapters as well and books as well. God goes on and on and on and on telling people that Christians, believers in Christ are to live by faith. We don't live by circumstances. We don't live by chance. We live by faith. There's no other way to live. We live by faith. Galatians 3.11 says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10, 38. Now that the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back my soul, shall he have no pleasure in him. Okay, God, again, he goes on and on and on about us believing in him. You know, just 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 believing in him, just having faith that um he can do things. You know, God doesn't ask us to do a lot of things. He doesn't ask us to do a lot of things. You know, he I think the number one thing I honestly believe that God asks us to do is to just have faith in him. Because if you have faith in God, you know, you have everything that you need. You know, you have everything that you need. God is we have to remember who he is. He is a father. He is our provider. He is the one that we, we go to, you know, in our in our times of need. He's the one that we go to in our times of need. He's the one that we go to when we're feeling desperate. He's the one that we go to when we don't have the answers, you know. And I have to thank the Holy Spirit right now. Let me tell you why. Because I'm trying to go into the next subject. And I'm looking for the verse. I'm looking for the chapter. I was in the wrong place. But the Lord is still speaking. You know, he's still speaking right now. And um, I have to, um, I got to thank him for that. Let's see. There it is. Straight. Oh, okay. I have to thank him for that, for always being faithful. Because anytime I do anything like this, I always ask God to, um, to give me the word. I always ask him to speak. And I always ask him to leave me because you can't do anything without God. Okay. All right. So 
that was faith. If you missed that message, just go ahead and rewind this whole thing and you'll see um, us talking about the subject of faith. We're going to go ahead and move on to the subject of keeping our eyes on God. And this one won't be too long. So what I'm going to be doing is reading out of the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 14. We're going to start at, um, let's see. We're going to start at verse 24. All right. And this is when the disciples was on the ship, you know, at sea and the raging storm was coming up. I'm pretty sure you've all heard of that right there. So, all right. We're going to read um, uh, Matthew 14, starting at verse 24. Uh, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went on to them, walking on the sea. Remember when Jesus walked on water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a spirit. And they cried out of fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. So you can imagine how they felt seeing him walk on the water, right? Verse 28, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come on the water with thee. And he said, and Jesus said, come. So Jesus is like, come on, Peter. If you want to walk on the water, come to me and you'll, you'll be good. And when Peter came down out of the ship, um, he walked on water to go to Jesus. And when he saw the wind bolstering, he was afraid. And in the beginning, he sank and he cried saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. And he said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore thou thou doubted. So I love that story. So basically, I titled this segment right here, Keeping Your Eyes on God at All Times. Here's a situation to where Jesus told Peter to come to me, come walk on water. You know, you asked me if you could walk on the water. So Peter steps out of the ship and he's actually walking on the water. So he sees Jesus in front of him and he's walking towards him, going towards him. But he made one mistake. And the mistake that he made was right here found in verse 30. But when he saw the wind bolstering, he was afraid. And in the beginning, and oh, not in the beginning, and beginning to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. So as he was walking to Jesus, he saw that the wind started to kick up. He saw the waves started to swish around and stuff like that. His fear began to, I want to say, cancel out or override his faith um, in God. And because that took place, he sank. He didn't keep his eyes on God. He started focusing on the storm around him. Okay, and had he kept his eyes focused on God, he would have made it to him. He would have walked all the way across. I think this is a great illustration to a lot of the things that, you know, we go through in life. And I can speak from experience and, you know, I, I got testimonies after testimony after testimony, like I'm sure um, a lot of people do. So this picture right here of Peter walking on the water. Uh, the storm, you know, I, I, I see that as our problems. Like, if you want to use this in a modern term, our issues, our problems, our storms. You know, a lot of us go through all different type of problems. A lot of us go through um, financial issues. A lot of us go through marital issues. A lot of us go through pain and suffering. Um, a lot, we, we just go through things. You know what I'm saying? Um I'm not gonna go search for it, but in the book, um, in the book of Matthew, um, and in the book of John, you know, Jesus told us, you know, in this life you're gonna have tribulations, you're gonna have trials, you're gonna have problems, you're gonna have issues. There's this, you're just not gonna go through this perfect life. Like, don't let some of these these preachers on TV tell you that, oh, everything's just going to be great. If you have faith and you believe and you're never going to go through problems, you're never going to get sick. You're never going to go through any book. No, it's just not true. 
You're going to go through problems. You're going to go through issues. Storms are going to come. But it is our responsibility to stay focused on God the whole time. It's our responsibility to keep our eyes on Christ. Jesus said, come to me. Jesus didn't say, well, Peter, look at the waves. Look at the wind. Look at the um the sharks in the water. You know, and Peter's like, oh, my gosh, look at all of this stuff right here. How am I going to make it to God? And then, boom, he sunk, basically. So the same goes with us. You know, if if we begin to focus on our issues and focus on our problems, we cannot be focusing on God. And the absolute worst place that you can end up is not focusing on God. If you don't focus on God, your mind will begin to play tricks on you. Your faith will begin to crumble and the enemy is going to creep in and he's going to just really tear you apart and ruin you because you're so focused on the problems that you have right now. Okay. Now, I believe that if we can believe what Jesus said, meaning we're going to have trials and tribulations in this life, if we can accept that that's going to be the reality, if we can accept that life is not going to be perfect until we go to heaven, that if we can accept that we're going to have things happen to us and problems and what have you, if we can accept that we don't have to give it any more attention than we already do. Now, naturally, our human instinct is going to be concerned about the problems that we have, the issues that we have, but we're not supposed to be focusing on those problems and those issues primarily. Um, this ties back into the first subject of having faith in God to get you through whatever it is you're going through. For Jesus told us that in this life, you're going to have trials, you're going to have tribulations, you're going to have problems. Listen, but don't give way. Keep faith in me because I have overcome the world. Okay, so no matter what you go through, I'm going to be with you. I used to um, use the analogy that if you're in a boat and you're in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Mexico or something like that, because, you know, down here in Florida, uh, we get hurricanes. So um, in the summer months, that water is pretty troubled. So if you're out there in the Gulf of Mexico and you're in the boat and a storm starts coming, you know, our problems and stuff like that. Um, one of the names for Jesus is called the anchor. Um, what does an anchor do? An anchor is something like a really, really, really heavy, reliable, tough object that we throw outside of the ship to keep the ship from wavering. You know what I'm saying? Um, again, going back to the subject of wavering, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back about 10 minutes and you'll see what I'm talking about in the book of James, um, where the Bible says that um, he that wavereth to and fro should not ask anything of the, of the Lord. An anchor which is, you know, um, symbolic for Jesus Christ, is going to keep us from wavering. It's going to keep us stable. It's going to keep that boat from moving around. You know what I'm saying? So I feel that if we, we cling to Jesus and we look at him as the anchor of our life, meaning no matter what we go through, no matter what happens, God is going to give us that stability that we need to stay calm, to have peace, to be able to function. Because the fact of the matter is that regardless of whatever it is we go through in life, we still have to function. Okay, so no matter what I go through in life, no matter what comes my way, I still have to function. I got three kids. I can't fall apart. I can't afford to fall apart. You know what I mean? So I have to have some assurance. I have to have some confidence. I have to have faith in God to keep me stable. Okay, and so do you. Okay, Peter, all he had to do was keep his eyes on Jesus. But since he didn't keep his eyes on the Lord, he sunk in the water. How many of us do that every day? If you're not focusing on God every day and you're focusing on your bills and you're focusing on your rent, you're focusing on your, your relationships and you're focusing on the troubles at your job and you're focusing on all these areas that you as a person can only do so much about, you're going to drive yourself insane. You're going to drive yourself crazy. Once again, you will never find anywhere in the scriptures where God says to focus on your problems. He has told us multiple times to uh, pray with all supplication. You know, any issues in which you're having, bring them to me and I will give you rest. I will give you peace. I will give you confidence. You know, the Lord never told us to figure anything out. He, he has told us to bring every request 
every prayer, every worry, every thought to him and let him take care of it. Um, like a father should, our heavenly father, okay? Um, it's just like me, my kids. Anytime my kids have a problem, what do they do? They come to me or they go to their mother. They go to one of us. And the reason that they come to us is because, number one, they trust us. Number two, they rely on us. Number three, they have confidence in whatever is wrong with them that we can fix. That is why our kids come to us. And that's exactly why we, as children of God, should go to him. If you believe in God, um, if you have confidence in God, then you should be going to him. You should have faith in him. You should focus on him and not focus on your problems. Peter, I mean, go back and read it, people. I really want you to read it for yourself. Uh, maybe God will reveal something to you, okay? Matthew 14, start with verse 25 and go all the way to verse 31 and just see what the Lord gives you because it's a perfect illustration of life because I can relate to all, you know, I can relate to just about everything when it comes to, to going through problems, you know, even to this day. You know, even though I walk with God, that does not mean that life is perfect. And I think a lot of people have that misconception that life is just going to be absolutely perfect when you start walking with the Lord. Um, that could be further from the truth. Um, things still happen to you. You still go through uh, tough times. You still go through trials and tribulations. But the only difference is you have the spirit of God dwelling within you right now that has the ability to give us a perfect peace that surpasses all understanding. Um, the spirit of God gives us strength. It gives us wisdom. It gives us knowledge. Um, it gives us the ability to cope. It gives us the ability to endure the things that go through, uh, that we go through um, throughout this life. Um, <clears throat> in the Garden of Gethsemane, Right before Jesus was arrested and taken away, uh, I remember I, I read this in the book of John a couple of months ago. It was right here at my bedside. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And God was, I mean, God, yes. Jesus was praying and he said, You know, Father, I don't pray that you take the you know the disciples out of out of the out of the, um the world. I don't pray that you take them away. I pray that you give them the strength to endure. I pray that you give them the ability to cope. That's what my prayer is, because if his prayer was to take out the disciples or to take out everybody that loves him, there would be no faith for people who don't know him. There would be no faith for people who have not yet been saved. So since we're still here, God's not just going to take us out of the equation. He's going to keep us here. And he's going to root up those who are strong in faith. He's going to root up those who love him. He's going to root up those who have a lot of wisdom. So we can relay that wisdom over to people who may not know the Lord. Because the biggest mission of a believer in Christ is to plant seeds. Because there are some people in the world who don't know Jesus Christ. There's some people in the world who are not saved. There's some people in the world who don't believe. Okay? And... People are passing away left and right, left and right, um, going in, going into eternity left and right. Um, I think there is a statistic that says there is a hundred and fifty. Let me see. A hundred and I don't know. I'll have to look up this study. I think it's more than one hundred and fifty thousand. I'm not sure. I have to look it up. But there's a massive amount of people who statistically die every single day. And all of those people who die every day are not following the Lord. All of those people that die every day don't know Jesus, okay? And again, the reason that the Lord has not just delivered us from the world and the problems of the world, because the Lord knows that there's just so much evil and corruption in this world, is because he needs us here. He needs us here. This is the battlefield right here for believers in Christ because there's people that seek him. There's people that still have answers. There's people that still want to know, and there's people that don't know. So as a as a as a soldier of the kingdom of God, we got work to do. Okay. All right. So 
We've covered faith. And if you've missed that, go back to the beginning of this live. And we just covered keeping our eyes on God. Okay. Now, the last subject that I want to talk about. And before I get into the scriptures, you know, I want to keep, I want, I want to be real for a moment. Okay. The last subject that I want to talk about is something that a lot of us can relate to. A lot of us can relate to. And this is the subject of guarding your eyes, guarding your eyes, um, what you lay your eyes on. Now, this is the age of social media. Facebook, Instagram, okay? You know, I can't count how many times a day I delete people. Most of them are females because I see things that have no business being on social media. I see things that um, should be preserved for that woman's husband that should be preserved for the privacy of their own home that should be covered by clothes okay uh, that that's what i see on social media and I, I i still don't understand you know what would make a person you know a woman um show as much skin as she does now there's probably going to be some people that go as far as to say well um, it's her body. She can do whatever she wants to do with it. Um, if she wants to wear that, she can wear that. Um, that should not affect um, anybody that's around her. You're wrong. You're wrong. Because by nature, it does affect um, those that look at that. When you see a woman with her, um, with her breasts hanging out, that affects a man. Because... It is natural for a man to want to look. It is natural because we are naturally attracted to females, okay? When a woman wears a skirt that comes above her, her thighs, a man is going to look at her legs. When a woman takes a picture and she's in a thong and so on and so forth, he is going to look because it's right there. Okay, and when I come across, you know, those type of images and stuff like that, I, del I just delete the person because it tells me that whatever is going on in their heart or whatever point they are in their life is they're not producing or bearing good fruit. Meaning, you know, whatever it is that they're they're into is it's, it's just not it's not good. It's corrupted. So instead of feasting my eyes on it, I remove it. And there's a lot of you men out there who need to practice the same thing. There's a lot of you men out there who add women to your social media account just because they have a nice body or just because they have a nice face. Now the face, there's you, you can only do so much about that because the face is what you see. You know, I have no problem with that admiring beauty. But when the clothes start coming off and all of that stuff, um, yeah, a lot of you guys out there like to add women because they take their clothes off or, and they show skin. You know, a lot of those women don't know better. And some of them do know better. Some of them do, do it for attention. Some of them do it for various reasons that I am just not going to get into because the video will be way too long. So we're going to close this out with two um, two different verses here. Uh, Psalms 101, verse 3. And it says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. So David's saying here that he is not going to set anything wicked before his eyes. And, um, this could go beyond, you know, just inappropriate pictures. It could go into inappropriate programming, pornography, um, excessive violence. Um, just a lot of things, you know. Basically, 
he's saying, you know, whatever anything that you set before your eyes is going to go straight to your soul. It's going to go to the pit of your spirit. And if you look at it enough and you watch it enough, eventually sin is going to manifest itself. So we need to be careful, guys and girls, what we set our eyes on. I know a lot of you ladies out there like to look at these nice, you look, these nice looking men with these nice bodies. And you trample over their bodies, the six packs and uh, the chest and all of that different type of stuff. And I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to lie to you because my background is fitness. My background is bodybuilding. And, you know, I spent a lot of years, you know, showing off my physique. And by me showing off my physique, I never thought that it had the potential to become a stumbling block. And it can. Now, I'm not trying to tell any of my bodybuilder friends out there, hey, you need to stop posting pictures of you with no clothes on. I'm not going to say that. Maybe it's not your conviction. Maybe you're not necessarily trying to seduce anybody. And maybe you're not becoming a stumbling block. And I don't have a problem with somebody showing off their hard work. But there is a certain way that you can show off your body to display hard work. And then there is another way that you can display your body in a seductive manner. I think we all know what I'm talking about. Guys, if you're taking pictures and, you know, and you're, you're, you're freaking uh, looking like you just got out of the shower and you got oil all on your chest and shining off your abs and you got a towel on, I don't think you're trying to show off your progress. I think that you're trying to seduce some ladies out there to uh, begin to fall into the sin of lust. And ladies, you're the same way, okay? If you have like, you know, thongs on and a bra and and you're sitting with your legs open like that, you know, I, I don't think that you're trying to show off your progress or your physique. I think that you're trying to cause some men to fall into the sin of lust as well because um, me as a man, when I see that, that's an invitation for sex and I'm not trying to like fall into that sin, so I just delete it, okay? So there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I'm just keeping it real, okay? So you need to, um, for you people out there who are trying to live righteous and you're trying to live holy and you're trying to follow the Lord, you need to be careful. You need to be careful who you choose to add on your friends list. And if you ask somebody on your friends list and they, they do things like that and you didn't know it, then maybe you need to, you have two choices. You know, you can either unfollow them or you can unfriend them. You know, it depends. The severity of the severity of what a person does is going to determine whether I delete that person or not. Because if I see it's a woman and the only thing she does is post selfies and butt pictures and photographs of her with her legs open for some weird reason, if that's the only thing that she chooses to um post then I delete her because as a man who's married um I don't have any it profits me nothing to view a woman in that manner it doesn't all it does is corrupt my mind all it does is make me look at my wife in a in a different manner all it does is create thoughts that have no business being in my head and ultimately um, you know, creating problems in my household because it all starts with the eyes. You know, some people say, I've heard the term, you can look, but you can't touch. I've heard the term, it doesn't hurt to look. I've heard the terms where everybody looks and stuff like that. Those are some problems, okay? Because like I said, it all starts with the eyes. You you look at something, you feast your eyes on something, as they say, and your mind just starts wondering. It just starts wavering. It starts playing over thoughts and scenarios. And you start just having these thoughts that you didn't have before. And before you know it, you're going to want to act on those thoughts. And those thoughts are going to manifest itself into sin and then sin manifests itself into action and then before you know it you just went from looking at a photograph on social media to full-blown sin 
because that's what that's how it starts. You see an attractive person and they get your attention. You see that person all the time. Then you're going to feel compelled to reach out to that person. Then you mess. For, well, actually, first it starts with you liking the pictures. You're going to start liking the pictures because it's what you like. You like her body, guys. You like his body, ladies. You like what you see, so you keep liking. Then you start being bold and you start commenting like, oh, ooh, nice body, ooh, ooh, and all of this stuff and different type of stuff, which is why I stopped posting photographs of my physique because I was getting way too much of that in my inbox and way too much of those. Um, that in my comment section and, that, and that's disrespectful to my wife um, but that's how it starts you know you get the likes you start with comments then you start with the inbox and when you start going to the inbox then yeah the conversation starts sparking up and you pretty much say what you would not say um, in public and then you know maybe that person may be interested in you I don't know then you start exchanging numbers and then you start talking and you start texting and then you start creating this bond and you start creating this secret relationship and then you start trying to make plans to meet each other and then you meet each other and then you sin and then you fall in and now you have problems at home. That is why it is so important for us to guard our eyes. Guard our eyes. If you are friends with somebody on social media that you feel is not a positive impact or has the potential to cause you to sin, get rid of them. Get rid of them. Why would you want anything to do with that in the first place? Why would you want somebody that's not of God um, on your friends list anyway? Somebody who is explicit in their language or sexual in their appearance. Why would you want to be a part of that in the first place? Okay. So the last verse I'm going to read is um, Job 31, verse 1. And it says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a maid? Let's rephrase that. I've made a deal with my eyes. Why? Then should I look upon a woman? Why? Why should I look at a woman? When I've made a covenant with my eyes, why should I look at a woman? Let's remember, Job was married. Okay. Job had a wife. And he's saying, I made a covenant with my eyes. I've made a commitment to this woman. I have pledged my allegiance to my marriage. So why should I look upon another woman? Why should I look upon another maid? How many of us ask ourselves that question? You know, how many of us ask ourselves that question? Guys, if you're married, you have a wife. Let's just say you've been married for like, I don't know, 10 years or something like that. So this is the same person you've been seeing for the last 10 years. And then you start seeing, you know, younger women or a woman who may um, be shaped a different way or a more desirable way, should I say, than your own wife. You know, what causes you to look at that woman? You know what I'm saying? Job is, is, is looking at it from um, a perspective that has God in the middle of it. Okay. Again, I've made a covenant. Job 31. One, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon the maid? Why should I look at a woman? I feel the same way. I feel the same way. I was having to talk with... I was having to talk with a really good brother in Christ not long ago. And he was saying to me, you know something? Am I ever going to see a woman? This is what he said. Am I ever going to see a woman that's more beautiful than my wife? And his answer was yes. Yes. But that does not mean that that woman has his best interest. It does not mean that that woman has the same spirit of his wife. It does not mean that that woman um, is the same person, has the same personality, can show him the same amount of love than his wife. So... 
he looked at it from the perspective of just because a woman may be physically more beautiful than my wife, um, and I know that's treading on dangerous ground for some of you people out there, but we can we can be honest and we we can say things without being afraid. Um, and that right there to me is, is, is a very, very strong man to be able to say, you know, just because I see a woman um, with a bunch of plastic in her, in her body in the face full of makeup and all this stuff. Um, yeah, she might be pretty, but, you know, this is my wife. This is the woman that I've chosen to marry. This is the person that um, I've invested in. This is the person that I've gone before God with and decided to create a covenant. Um, I don't care about what that how that woman looks i don't care about um what that woman wears i don't care what this woman does all i care about um is the woman that the lord has given me okay and you know i feel the same way you know i feel the same way you know I, my wife is um she is the complete opposite of me you know i'm I'm a, I'm a big guy and um she's a small woman you know i'm about 230 pounds Okay, six foot, six foot, two hundred and thirty pounds. I'm a big guy. Okay, you got y'all have seen the pictures. You've seen me and her together, and she's small. She's about five foot one, a hundred and ten pounds. So I weigh way more than she does. I'm taller than she is, just physically bigger than she is. But the love that I have for her, it has absolutely nothing to do with the physical appearance her love that she has for me has absolutely nothing to do about my physical appearance she rarely even mentions my physical appearance she doesn't say it. she really doesn't she says nothing about my physical appearance you know there's no intimidation there's no there's no wow there's nothing she appreciates we appreciate each other um, beyond the flesh, you know, we have gotten to that. We've gotten to that point where we appreciate each other uh, for who we truly are, and who we truly are is our our soul, the soul being, the personality. Uh, we've looked past the looks. We've looked past all of that stuff. So, seeing an attractive person really does not do anything for either of us because we're past it. You know, that was what we wrestled with and that's what we um we went through in our younger years, you know, but growing and maturing and living together and, and creating um three beautiful children and, and striving and, and trying our best to thrive together. We don't have time to focus on things that are outside of this union of marriage. We don't have time to look in this direction or to look in that direction when we're both still trying to focus on Christ and that we're still trying to focus on going forward. Um, you know, just yesterday we were talking in the car and I told my wife, and said, you know what, we're, we need to, we're, we're going to relocate soon. I said, we're going to relocate soon. We're going to move away um move to a different state within the next three to five years and she um you know she was looked she looked at me she was she looked at me she was in agreement she's like you know what yeah you know we we um we can do that so in order for us to make that move happen we need to do some things here we need to be focusing on um a plan you know financially financial plan business plan um, all different type of things that we need to be focusing on so that we can get into that next level and we can get into that next position. Um, so to say the least, we really don't have time to be focusing on things of the world. We don't have time to focus on other people, so to speak. Like, I don't care about other women. I just don't care. You know, I care. I care for the souls of other females. But when it comes to enticement, when it comes to beauty and stuff like that, that really doesn't do anything for me because, like I said, number one, I'm married. Number two, my thought process is beyond the flesh. Um, I'm looking at a person's soul and I'm looking at what is in the best interest of myself, what's in the best interest of my family, what's in the best interest of my marriage. And the best interest is not lusting over women. 
okay? Now, if you are just chiming in, we are talking about the subject of guarding your eyes, okay? Guarding your eyes, you know, the things that we see on TV, the things that we see on social media, the people that are on our friends list, go through your friends list and start cleaning it out. If you have people on your friends list that will cause you to stumble, you need to get rid of them. You need to delete them. You need to go the other way and focus on your ladies, focus on your husband, guys, focus on your wives. Um, the divorce rate is over 70 to 75 percent in America. And I think that's I think that that is horrible. I think it's horrible. I think that. Um, one of the number one reasons for divorce is, you know, financial problems. Number two is infidelity. You know, social media plays a role in that too. That's why a lot of people just don't have Facebook or Instagram because of that, that same issue. But, um, if you choose to have social media, then I highly recommend that you go to through, you know, your friends list. Okay. Because at the end of the day, I think all of us want to be in happy relationships. I think all of us want to be in a peaceful environment. We all want com um, what's it, commitment. We do, we want commitment, but we want contentment as well with the person in which we have selected to dwell with. And we don't want any drama. We don't want any, um, any outside interference. And the only way to do that is by being responsible enough to say, you know, I'm not going to lay my eyes on this. I'm not going to lay my eyes on that. I'm not going to focus on this. I'm not going to focus on that. Um, and I'm just going to focus on the goal that's at hand, which is the person that I'm with, the person that I love, um, of course, God as well. Okay, so for this subject, go ahead and study Psalms 1013. Okay, write that down. Psalms 1013. In Job 31, verse 1, those are the two books and chapters and verses that um, I'm sure there are more, but those are the ones that I've selected when it comes to talking about the subject of guarding your eyes. Because um, if you don't guard your eyes, people, uh, you can cause a lot of problems. You can cause a lot of issues, guys, especially us guys. You know, we are, you know, visual, physical you know, beings, you know, we love, we just love to look, you know, that's just the way it is. Our eyes are, are something that we, um, we get a lot of pleasure out of and we have to control that, you know, and there are some women out there too, who, who like to look, but I find that this is more of an issue with men. Um, we like to look a lot more than the ladies, but that doesn't excuse the ladies, you know, ladies. I know women are like emotional, um, sentimental. They like when they're given attention and when somebody's talking to them. Um, if you're married and there's some guys out there who know how to run game on ladies, you know, and if you're married and you see a guy trying to talk to you or trying to butter up to you, wise up, wise up and be, be diligent, be smart. Be responsible and get yourself out of that situation because you don't need any problems. You don't need any problems, you know. But all right, before I go, I want to give a shout out to my wife. Okay. I'll give a shout out to my wife. Number one, you know, she bought this little Bible for me for my birthday. And number two, this is a notepad. Well, notepad. It's a journal, we'll say, that um, I have here. I have a lot of my notes in here. You know, when I read the scriptures, I don't just read. I I study. I um, take notes. Because if you just read the word, you know, just by itself, I'm not saying that's bad, but if you just read the word, it's it's difficult trying to retain that that knowledge. It's not easy to remember everything that you that you read, which is why I feel I feel that it's important that we write things down, that we take notes. You're more likely to remember things when you when you take notes. Okay, so the reason I want to give my wife 
a um, shout out is because many of you know um, she makes a whole lot of, trying to find something around here that she makes but I can't find anything but um, she makes a whole lot of stuff um, she creates cups bags custom shirts all different type of stuff so she she um, made this for me like we bought this I bought this at Target like the actual journal but the lettering here she did this for me okay she did this for me and the reason that I wanted this on here is to remind me the significance of studying the significance of reading the word of God the significance of of just taking notes you know when you're a professor when you go to college and stuff like that um and the professor is talking you you write things down you take notes you know what i'm saying and you need to do the same thing when you read the word of god now i don't know if you all can see that i'm not sure if it looks backwards i'm not sure if um if it's forward or not i'm not sure but what it says is to study to show thyself approved unto god second timothy 2 15 okay so it's like anytime i pick this up um i'm not just looking at a blank no notebook i'm looking at um scripture the first thing i see is scripture i see study to show that self-approved uh second timothy uh 2 15 and it reminds me why i've picked this notebook up and it reminds me why I've picked this Bible up. It reminds me of that stuff. I wouldn't be able to do this live right now had I not took these notes. I mean, we've been we've been at it literally for an hour. Oh my gosh, it's been an hour. I started doing this at eight o'clock. Now I've done lives before without scriptures and my Bible and stuff, but it I can put things deeply in perspective when i have my bible and when i have notes so it is very very important that we take notes so if you're somebody out there and you study the scriptures take notes i have so many notes here so many subjects i want to cover i want to cover the subject of being humble okay i want to cover the subject of um, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, okay? Um, I want to cover the subject of marriage. I want to cover the subject of the heart, I wanna, which is what I'm doing right now. Um, I'm studying the subject of the heart. And I'm not talking about the organ that pumps blood. I'm talking about the inner man. I'm talking about the inner person. You know what I'm saying? Like, using the phrase heart. Like, like if somebody says, like, what is the heart? of earth and they would say well it's you know the core the the inside of the on um, the earth and that is the terminology that the bible is talking about when it talks about the heart it's talking about the inward part of the man it's not necessarily talking about the flesh the fleshy organ uh, that is there okay so okay i'm about to close this out um if you missed it Make sure that you go back to the beginning. Again, I was on here for like a whole hour talking about three different subjects. Um, hopefully it blesses somebody out there. Appreciate everybody who has commented. Thank you for watching. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for listening. Um, if you feel the need to share the live, you're more than welcome to go ahead and do that. If you wanna share it, if you feel like it's gonna bless somebody, uh, go right ahead and do so because I don't do this for me. I don't put this on here for me um, I do this for everybody else. Okay. God bless you all um, again. It's about nine o'clock um, and We're probably not gonna be going to church this morning because like I said in the beginning of this live um, I am not feeling well. I'm really not. I have an infection and one of my kids is dealing with I think pink eye or some allergies and it sounds like both of my younger ones are up right now. So they were asleep when I first started doing this because I hear a bunch of noise. So um, keep us in prayer. Um, we keep everybody else in prayer as well. Hopefully we can make it to church on Wednesday. So, But if you can make it to church this morning, uh, hopefully this gave you some fuel to get up and go. So if you can make it to church this morning, go ahead and go and receive the word. Okay. All right. Get to church. 
take a Bible to church, okay? Um, so most churches provide Bibles, but take your own. Take your own Bible. And take a notebook, too, because um, your, your pastor is going to give a message. And you can only remember so much of that message. So write down what he says. Write down what he says and then bring it back to Facebook and share. You know what I'm saying? Share. And maybe it'll bless somebody. All right? God bless you all. Have a great Sunday.